Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to today's class. We are uh, moving towards the end of this course pretty soon. We have uh, this class and one more coming up. So let me share my screen. Um, <clears throat> let's do this uh, quick look at our syllabus once again. <clears throat> okay, so we've done most of these topics. We'd be covering hypothesis testing. Uh, some of it, some of like a half of part of these two weeks today and half of it next week and these topics next week as well. Um, we've covered PCA already. Um, so there's been some shuffling all through from the beginning, right? So uh, regardless, the topics we are supposed to cover is hypothesis testing. That's what these two are covering. Uh, the, another topic would be anything to do with clustering, which is what this is. This will go, go for next week. Um, so we'd be covering uh, part of hypothesis testing now and then rest of whatever is left out next week. Um, <clears throat> also, I want to make a, you know, a, some sort of a statement that what you've seen in week one was kind of introductory and then you, you've seen some advanced machine learning models like SVM, random forest, neural networks. You learned how to do cross-validation and how to, you know, use these techniques, fit these parameters. So all this, and then you've seen how to evaluate these techniques uh, in here. So anything about week eight, right, till week seven was more machine learning focused. Um, week one is obviously an exception. It was more like prerequisite material. Um, but this was more machine learning focused. Week two was a little more statistical modeling focused. Um, <coughs> week nine and 10, the, co the topics that we'd be covering now are mostly from a statistical standpoint. Um, this is not considered machine learning uh, for the most part. Um, the only reason this is there in here, and it's usually there in a lot of courses, is because um, this is more like basic apply, basic statistics uh, that is used in, uh, in practical uh, situations. So it's more like a prerequisite stat material. Um, <clears throat> it's very classical concepts. These concepts have been there for uh, some of them for about 100 years. So it's not like... SVM or neural networks, which have been there around since the 80s or 90s, right? Um, so these are more classical concepts. It's something that everyone should be knowing because these kind of topics keep coming up, things like p-values and stuff. If you're doing statistical analysis and modeling, yeah, not, not always, but uh, if you're doing these kind of work, it's common terminology and stuff, uh, concepts that you need to be aware of. You may not be an expert in it, obviously, like other topics right away, but at least you'd be aware of what is the overall workflow. What, are, what is the overall methodology and at least some concepts you'd be knowing a little more rigorously, if not everything. Uh, similarly, clustering is again, I mean, we can call it machine learning or statistics. It's just the unsupervised technique. There's nothing to do with prediction or classification. It's, it's all about grouping your data into different groups. So it's kind of exploring your data. It's very popular. People do it from all kinds of fields, use it every now and then. That, that'll be for uh, coming up, uh, coming week. So let's get started. Um, running short of time so let's get our slides open i'll be using a combination of slides today um because i've noticed some slides are doing a good job at some particular topics so we'd, we'd be using all three <coughs> so let's start with this um this is where we would start okay so we'd be covering hypothesis testing so the question is if you've not heard about it what is hypothesis testing um, so basically, a hypothesis is like some sort of a statement you're making, uh, and you want to test whether that statement is true or not uh, by using your data set. So you have a data, you're trying to make some sort of a hypothesis, um, and then uh, you want to make sure statistically if, it is, if that hypothesis that you're making is statistically significantly true, or if it is statistically not true, so that you have to reject the hypothesis and so you would go with the alternate of what the hypothesis you initially started with. So that's the overall idea. I'll give you an example to make it clearer, uh, a practical example so that it will make more sense. Um, but before we go there, we want to cover a few terminologies, which is very standard. So null hypothesis, alternate hypothesis, test statistic rejection region, right? So what is this? This is very standard terminology. Null hypothesis is the hypothesis that you want to test. So it's basically the statement you're making about either some parameters or, you know, I don't want to read through this statement, but because um, this is one specific example, the way he's defined it, 
But basically, null hypothesis is the statement that you are making uh, that you want to check from your data if it's true or not. Alternate is if null were not true, what would be the alternate? So it's the other way around. Um, the test statistic is what you would use to determine how strongly you would accept the null or how strongly you would reject the null and go with the alternate. Rejection region has something to do with the test statistic as well. So these are just, just the terminologies. We'll make it more clear. What is really required at this point is to give you a few examples so that you get some idea about it. So for example, this is a good example for where hypothesis testing is useful. Right? Say a company, a pharmaceutical company has, after like years of work, come up with a new drug, um, new possible drug. <coughs> So the drug company now wishes to compare it with the current standard treatment, right? So there are drugs, say, uh, currently existing, and you want to see how better you're doing against the standard treatment or not, uh, how, how, much, how much the same are you doing or how, how worse are you being with what the standard treatment is. So this is a very typical hypothesis testing scenario. So uh, basically, uh, say, this is more story, right? This is... I mean, yeah, just put in more story. So there's the story here is the, the federal regulators who approve the drugs and everything uh, tell the company that they must demonstrate that the new drug is better than the current treatment to receive approval. Uh, that's obvious. A firm runs clinical trials where some patients receive the new drug and others receive the standard treatment. So this is known as a treatment control uh, experiment where uh, the stand, you want to compare the standard treatment versus the new drug. So there would be a bunch of people, patients receiving the standard treatment, a bunch of patients receiving the new drug. Uh, designing a clinical trial to keep it unbiased and, you know, uh, uh, make sure no cheating is involved and it's being done the right way. There's obviously a lot more uh, work that goes into it, but this is the overall story. Um, now you would have results from both sets of patients, right? So you would have some numeric response of the therapeutic effect, right? So if it was a drug to do with one particular kind of fever, you can measure all the kinds of parameters of how the fever is doing, right, before and after, and uh, how his uh, critical parameters are, etc. Uh, so this thing can be, again, from a business case perspective, you'd have different ways to measure your experiment, experimental performance. So in the end, what is the hypothesis test about? You want to see if the mu is denoting average here, so you want to see if the average performance with respect to these metrics of the new drug uh, how different is it with respect to the average performance of the standard treatment that is currently being used widely? So this is a typical example of what a hypothesis test is. You have experiment, you have deep data coming from the experimental results, and you have a hypothesis that you're testing. So this is the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is stating is new drug is no better than the standard treatment, which means the difference is of the new drug minus the standard treatment is less than or equal to zero, assuming both are positive values, if the way you're measuring, whatever measure is. Say for fever, right? You cannot have a negative fever, for example, that kind of thing. So you want to see if the improvement in the new drug is better than the standard treatment, then it will it'll be less than zero. If it is the same, it will be around zero. Um, uh, so you want to see <coughs> how the improvement is. So this is a typical null hypothesis. Um, now, depending on your, the what you're measuring and what the sign of that measure is, you can always have greater than or equal to zero, whatever makes sense to you. Uh, but this is one example of the null hypothesis. Now, what is the alternate? If you choose this as a null, obviously the alternate is the other way around, greater than zero, which would indicate, say, the standard treatment has a better effect, uh, which means there is no point using this drug at all. It's not even the same, but it's like it's not. It's worse than the current treatment, uh, right? So you have some data coming up, and now we need to do something about uh, statistically saying confidently that one thing is better than the other or not better, right? So this is a typical example of a hypothesis test. Now what I do is at this point, um, I would show you this actually. So what are the kind of decisions that a hypothesis test could make if you had a way to measure this? So you have a null hypothesis, which is the H0, um, and you have an alternate hypothesis, which is H0 is false. Here, null hypothesis H0 is true. So it's a two by two table. So your test, if it's a very good test, if the H0 is true, is the, the true answer is that H0 is the real answer, which means you need to go with the null hypothesis, which means that new drug is better, for example. Uh, if the hypothesis test is always catching that correctly, uh, this is the true state, this, this is what the result is saying. If the true state is being captured always correctly, it's like a confusion matrix in your 2 by 2 class K form, then this 
this is the kind of correct decisions it would make. If it's if the true state is that the null hypothesis is true, but your hypothesis test rejects your null hypothesis, whatever test you're using, which means in all reality, your new drug is better, but your all your testing says new drug is not better, which means you would go with the wrong decision. So you're making an error, which means the type 1 error, which means you're sticking to a bad drug, like a worse drug, although you have a better drug now. So that's a t known as a type 1 error. This is one kind of an error. It's type 1 error. The other kind of error is called type 2 error. Or it's the other way around. The null hypothesis is false, and your test assumes that it is true, which means in reality, your new drug is worse than the worse than the current drug, and your all your analysis and hypothesis test would say the other way around. It would say no, go with the new drug, which means you're making again a bad decision. So it's a type two error. So when H naught is false, if your test says H naught is false, it's a correct decision. If it's true, and if you say it's true, then it's a correct decision. So uh, these are very common terminologies. The type one error, type two errors, always use the same terminology in hypothesis testing. Um, type The probability of committing a type 1 error is called alpha. The probability of committing a type 2 error is called beta. Because we're talking about data sets and like real life phenomena, you always want to talk in terms of probability, right? Because a test may not be 100% true every single time, right? I mean, things are not always that easy. Life is not that fair. So there's going to be some mistakes. But the question is, is the probability of committing this kind of an error very high or very low? Same, similar question with here. That's why you're always concerned about probabilities uh, in terms of certainty and uncertainty. So this was the example we talked about. Um, we looked at this as one particular example. Now, we, before we jump into how hypothesis testing is done, it's really important for you to understand the overall workflow. So that's where I'm jumping to this slide show. Um, okay. Oops. <laughs> All right. So. What are the usual steps in any hypothesis test? Step one, you obviously formulate what your null hypothesis is and what is your alternate hypothesis. Because you need to make some hypothesis before you test it, right, using data. And then the question is, what is the right test that you want to use to test whether this is true or this is true, whether you go with this or that? So that's obviously the next step. Then there is something called level of significance. This is the alpha that we were talking about. What is the level of significance? It's basically saying, do you want to run a test where you want to take a decision of whether you go with H0 or H1 based on 95% confidence or 95% probability of being confident about what you're doing or 80% or 99%? It, it depends on what you're doing, right? If it's something super critical, maybe you want to keep it more than 90% or 97.5% about if it's something that, depending on your business situation or your academic situation, if you're looking at a test where all you care about is like a 90% accuracy, then you make it 90%, right? So you want to make sure what level of significance you're looking for. And based on that, what people do is the test you choose always comes along with what is known as a test statistic. This is some calculation that you can make from your data set. So you make that calculation and you look at that calculation along with the level of significance you choose, and then you decide uh, whether you reject or do not reject the null hypothesis. Um, so if you do not reject it, it means you go with H0. If you reject it, it means you go with H1. Um, I will zoom into these four boxes of what happens after you calculate the test statistic into before you take the decision and as you go along, because uh, it's too early to talk about it right now. It might be overwhelming, but we will cover it today. Um, so this is something we've covered. We know what the hypothesis, uh, null hypothesis means, what alternate hypothesis means. Um, so uh, let me give you an example now. So say you had a data set and suppose you wanted to test the hypothesis that the mean familiarity rating exceeds 4.0, uh, where the neutral point value on a seven point scale so you have a seven point scale and you're measuring something and you want to test if the mean would always be more than 4.0. Uh, significance value is 0 0.05. What does this mean? It means you're taking a confidence, you need to make a t uh, test decision with the confidence of 95%. So one minus alpha is the confidence. Alpha is the error you're making. So your probability of committing a type one error is 0.05. It's very low because you do not want to be committing errors with a high probability. In the, t in the table I showed you, there is a type 1 and type 2 error. Alpha is controlling for the type 1 error, which means the H0 is true, but your 
you're saying it's not, and you're going with H1. Um, so if you're so confidence and alpha are kind of synonymous. So if alpha is low, it means confidence is high. If alpha is 0.01, which means you need a test where you take a dation with 99% confidence. If it's 0.05, it means 95% confidence. So this, like I showed you in the flow chart, right? You define your H0, H1, then you also need to choose a test and also choose a level of significance along with it. Um, so the hypothesis is, since you want to compare whether it, the average performance is less than or equal to 4 or if it is greater than 4. So this is the null and alternate. Now the next step was compute a test statistic, or choose a test, right? So the test and the test statistic are this, which is, this is known as a uh, z-test. Uh, so you're computing the average from your data set, um, and then you're comparing with the value you're comparing with, um, and then the denominator is the, the standard deviation of this uh, average. But I, want to, I don't want to complicate things because you can do lots of null and alternate hypotheses and you can use different kinds of tests. I will list all the different popular tests, but this is one popular test that you're using which, which is uh, relevant to this particular kind of hypothesis because you're testing the mean. Uh, so, so this, but this is the flow of things. I'm giving an example of what is the overall methodology. So you have a test, so you're measuring how different the data is saying it is from the true average uh, of whether it is away from 4 or closer to 4, right? Um, so you compute this value from your data set. So the mu is 4, that's what you're testing against. And then you're, test, you're seeing what your average of your data set is saying. Your data set's the average is 4.7. And then obviously since you are having a data set and you're computing an average mean, the mean also has some deviation, standard deviation, right? Because 4.724, if you computed that as the average of your data set, it doesn't mean it's always the average. Your data set is just a sample that you're observing, right? You're not observing like infinite students if you're measuring their scale of performance. You're measuring, say, 40 students. So you want to see what is your uh, uncertainty around the average that you're measuring, which is what the denominator is in this test, the SX bar, which is 0.293. So that's the standard deviation of your average. So now you want to see if you measured an average of 4.7 with a deviation of plus or minus 0.293, this is your error bar around what you're measuring. Now the question is, is it significantly different from the 4 or not? And based on that, you can go with whether you go with H0 or you go with H1. Is it significantly smaller or bigger? So this is your calculated uh, value. Now what you do is, uh, now this is where I need to draw something before you really get this concept. Um, so what I will do is actually draw uh, something not good luck. Okay. So what is the big picture? It's really important to understand the big picture and then you will understand those specifics that I'm showing you there. Uh, so you choose a, uh, you define your hypothesis and then we're talking about the test statistic, right? Which is say if you're measuring the, the one that you're looking at, you're looking at how different is the average that you observed, this is your observed value, from what you want to measure because your null hypothesis was this mu equal to 4, right? And then you also want to take care the error or the variation in observing this average that you observed, which is what is going into the denominator, right? The SD, the standard deviation of the X bar. Why is this a good test statistic? Let's just keep throwing a lot of whys and hows into whatever I'm saying so that you understand it better. Why is this a good test statistic? Because you're trying to measure how far you are from 4. Are you away uh, in a way that you're much greater than 4? Then you go with one hypothesis. Are you much lesser than 4? Then you go with one hypothesis. Uh, if you're looking at greater than or equal to, we go with one hypothesis, right? Uh, so the bigger this difference, the stronger the signal you're observing in taking a decision. If this was very close to four, and especially because there's a variability in what you're measuring in the denominator, of, there's a variability in measuring this quantity, then you're not very confident about, hey, we are measuring if it's different from four, and what I'm observing is 4.01, but... I'm not very sure. I'm observing 4.1, but 
what I really have is 4.1 plus or minus some error bar, right? So plus or minus, say the error is big, it's big one. So if you're going the other side of the error, it could have been anywhere between 3.1 to 5.1. That's what you're measuring. So basically there is some confidence you're having, but your confidence bar is kind of big. So your X bar that you observed is saying it's somewhere less than or equal to this, right? 4.1. This is one, sorry. So now it's really hard to take a decision because if it was 3.1, you take one decision because it is less than four. If it's, if it's uh, I don't know, 5.1, you take another decision because it's much above, uh, uh, above four. So then you're highly uncertain in making a decision. So that is the reason this error bar is what the denominator is measuring. You're looking at the average, you want to make some statement with the respect to the average. So the effect of what you're trying to measure, the effect size is what you're measuring on the top but this is the noise. So this is like the signal to noise kind of a ratio. Ideally, if you want to have a very confident decision, the numerator should be very big, right? So much difference from what you're trying to measure, what you're trying to uh, observe, and the error bar is much tighter. So maybe plus or minus 0.1, then you're very confident about the decision of whether you go with H0 or H1. This is the reason that was the test statistic that was chosen in, the, in that slide. So, so that's the answer to the why. This is a good test statistic. Now, given this test statistic, now there are other things involved, which is there is this uncertainty that you're coming up with. So, and there's also a significance you're choosing. So one minus alpha is the confidence level you want to have while deciding your decision, right? While taking your decision. So if you choose a confidence level of 99%, it's a different way of looking at this test. If you want a confidence of 70%, it's a different way of looking at this test. So how, now the question is, how do you factor in your choice of confidence level into how you run the test, right? So say the user chose, chose the 95% like, where do you, how do you factor it in? Um, so what you do is the follows, the, again a big picture, the test statistic is this. Now we figured out why this is a good test statistic, so tick mark, now we're figuring out something more. But the thing is the test statistic is also a random quantity, right? In a way that it has its own distribution function. You know, some values of test statistics are more likely, some are less likely. So they say there is some distribution of your test statistic. Um, so this is your test statistic on the x-axis, the different values this can take, and this is the y-axis is the probability. So it's the probability density function, so distribution. So, so maybe some values of test statistics are more likely, some values, like in this tail, these test statistics are less likely. So now what you do is, you know what the distribution of this test statistic is, and then now you say, I want 95% accuracy in the decision I'm taking. So now you compute the test statistic on your data set. So this is what this value is, the test statistic observed. So you, when you compute it, you literally have some number. Because you compute the average, you compute the difference from four, you divide it by the error bar that you're having on the average, so you get some number. That is the test statistic observed, right? So say that number was something like this number. But then you know, since you know the distribution of the test statistic, you know that number that you observed within your data set is low probability, because it's this, this is high probability, this is low, this is zero, this is one, right? So you observed a low probability event, which means, which means you, you, you are less confident about taking the decision. Uh, but if it's a high probability event, then you're more confident, because this happens more often. So that is how your one minus al your choice of confidence that you're typing into your computer takes uh, get, uh, gets used as part of running the test. So, so because if you compute, this is known as the tail probability, the entire probability under the curve, if you measure the area under the curve, it would be one. That is how probability works, that is a total probability. But if you measure just the shaded region below this, and if this is less than 0 0.05, say it is 0 0.025, then it is one thing. Uh, so it's very highly unlikely event, unlikely event. So to observe something more extreme than what you observed. Say you observed this value, the, the probability of observing some value more and greater than that is very, very low. So it means what you observed is very unlikely even. But say you observed this value, then the probability under the curve is, say maybe, I don't know, 50% or 60%, which means it's very likely you would always observe it very, very often. So based on that and your choice of one minus alpha, you decide and the observed value of your test statistic. So there are different things going on. The test statistic is observing how strong a signal you're having. 
the alpha and the distribution of the test statistic is giving you information of how certain or uncertain is what you observed. What you observed happens very often or is it very unlikely that it is happening? It's like an extreme event. Uh, based on all these three things, the, the test statistic, the distribution of the test statistic, and the choice of confidence that you want to have in your test decision making, you take these three things into consideration and see whether your value that you observed, which is the TS observed, falls within a normal region, which is the acceptance region, like normal behavior, or does it fall in like extreme behaviors, like less than this value or greater than this value. And how extreme it is, it is chosen based on your choice of confidence. So if you want if it is, if your confidence level is very high, then you will be very tight about how much probability you will allow in this tail. If it is very low, then you will allow for more probability, right? So, that, so this is your acceptance region. Anything in the tail is your rejection region. So if something is observed in a very common way, then you accept your test. If not, you reject it and say, no, I will reject the null hypothesis and I will go with the alternate hypothesis. And by the way, since you have two hypotheses, null and alternate, your test statistic is usually measuring how much uh, is measuring how how much you would go with the null hypothesis. So if you reject the test statistic, you would fall in the if you fall in these regions of what you observed, then you would say I will go with the alternate. If you fall in the acceptance region, you go with the null hypothesis. You accept the null hypothesis. Um, so that's it. Any questions here? Um, this is a very, uh, this is a concept that's been studied very deeply by a lot of people, okay? So this is very mature uh, area. Uh, there are books that go very deep into the concept of hypothesis testing, but there, at the same time, this is also used by a lot of practitioners by just understanding the concepts that I've shared with you right now. So these are more practical concepts. Um, so they, they literally run these things on computers. Um, Let's, uh, let me show you something actually. So since you were talking about Tableau, right? Tableau, if you do a t-test, t-test is a popular hypothesis test for dif testing the difference in two averages, average performances. So you can see, you know, Tableau comes up with a lot of results with t-test, uh, so on and so forth. R would have even more, SPSS, all these, would have all these functions. But the way, the, to running, running this test from a coding perspective is super easy. It's usually just one or two lines of code and it's not even code that you write, it's literally a function call that you use. You just pass in the data into it and you choose what confidence level you want. But the output of it would be things like p-values and all these probabilities. So you need to understand what's going on to be able to interpret it, right? Uh, then you take the right decision. So that's the reason we're learning this from an applied perspective so that you'll be able to use these on the computer. Um, now let's go back to the slides. So let's continue with the drug example, right? Is the new drug better or worse than the standard treatment? That's the null hypothesis is it is no better. The alternate is it is better. Now, which one do you choose based on your data set? So now you run experiments, right? So you run experiments on patients that take the new drug and you run, exp you take, uh, you also have a bunch of patients that take the standard treatment. Now you have numbers coming out in terms of how the performances is. So what you want to really measure is how different is, so if, say, Y1 bar is coming from people who took the new drug, Y2 bar is the average performance of people who took the bad, uh, the, the standard treatment. So you want to see which one is better, which average performance is better. Now, if you want to measure that, the beauty is there is a test called the t-test, um, uh, which is a paired t-test. So this is a test of measuring two differences. So in the previous slide, in the other slide, we saw you only look at one average and you take another number and say, is this average greater than four or less than four? But here you're taking two averages, so two populations. So two data sets give you two average numbers. Now we want to measure which data set, which, which drug do you go with? So this is a uh, two sample test because you're taking two samples instead of one sample like before. So for that you have another test, it's called a two sample t-test. So this is the test statistic. Uh, you're in the numerator, you're measuring how what the difference is, and in the denominator, you're measuring the standard deviation of the difference, which is this. Now, uh, now the question is, uh, you also want to know the distribution of your test statistic, like I drew in that diagram. So there is a lot of 
derivations in theory that that will always prove that whatever averages you take, if you compute this quantity, it will always be normally distributed with mean zero and variance one. This is the beauty. It's, it, it is derived from what is known as central limit theorem. But this is not a mathema advanced mathematics course, so we want. I don't want to go through the derivation. But this is, but these are the steps involved, right? Because there is a test statistic, and the test statistic has a distribution. So that is exactly being shown in here when you're doing this drug-related uh, hypothesis testing. Um, now, it could you could use it for a lot of things, right? It's not really necessarily just drug, right? This this kind of question could be asked a lot of times. Uh, is is Indian cricket team doing better than Australian cricket team or not? Now you look at the cricket matches and the scores and the performances of the Indian team. You look at the Australian team. You have some differences. Now you, want, you have to take a decision. Obviously, India is not going to beat Australia in every match. Australia is not going to beat India in every match. So there is some uncertainty involved. So even for that data set, if you took uh, or the same thing, Steffi Graf versus Andre Gassi, right? Or Pete Sampras versus Andre Gassi in tennis. How do you take these decisions statistically significant way? All you do is you compute their average scores, you compute the differences, you put in their variances, the standard deviations. N1 and N2 is the size of the sample. So N1 is how many games one person played, N2 is how many games this person played. Or N1 is the number of patients that received this drug, N2 is the number of patients. So it's a very simple quantity. You can even compute it with your calculator or with like just an Excel sheet. You don't have to write like a Python script to do this. It's a very simple quantity, but the beauty of the math is this one, if you do this again and again, if you plot the distribution, the histogram, it will look like a normal distribution with zero and uh, mean zero and variance one. So this is the, the power in here. But anyway, so the test statistic is there. You have a distributional uh, assumption, uh, distributional derivation. So you know what distribution that test statistic holds. Uh, now you, once you have that, now you choose the, the confidence that you need to choose. Do you want a confidence? of 95%, then you choose probability type 1 error is 0 0.05, because 1 minus alpha is 95%. Um, type 2 error, we will talk about it later, okay? Of course, there are two kinds of errors, right? I showed you in the in the table. So this is the type 1 error. When H0 is true, if you if you make an error of saying H0 is false, that's the type 1 error. This is another kind of error. You need to control for both. Uh, but there's a theorem that you cannot do the best with both. So there is some, if you're doing good with one, you'll be doing little bad with the other. So there is a trade-off. Um, anyway, so the, you have the test statistic, the same thing I showed you here. Now you chose a, a, okay, how do I take this out? Is this blocking you, what's in here? Yeah, the bottom part. Can you see the screen now, or am I? Yeah, we can, can see the formula. Okay, now you can see it. Okay. So yeah, you have the test statistic. Now you know that it, you know what the distribution is. Then you chose an alpha of 95% uh, confidence. So now your rejection region is. You, you see, they look at the distribution. You look at the observed value of the test statistic. You compute this from your data set and see, based on that distribution, is it falling above the 95% or the below the 95%? Based on that, you choose whether you take the null hypothesis or reject it. That's what's being shown in this diagram, right? If it's fall, this is the error, right? If your observed value is falling somewhere here, you reject, you, you, uh, uh, you take one decision. If it's falling, you reject the decision. You take the reject decision. If it falls here, you take the acceptance decision. So the p-value is the same thing. It's the area under the curve that I drew before in that uh, cartoon, the same thing, the area under this curve. So the sum of probabilities in this region, rejection region, um, is known as the p-value. It's a very, very common term. You ha we would have seen it when you ran linear regression in R. Some of you asked me, what does this p-value mean? What does this test mean? There, what they were measuring was a specific test of whether the coefficient of every given variable, the null hypothesis was whether it will be zero or it will be other than zero. If it was zero, it means that variable is useless for regression. It's not very predictive. If it's non-zero, it means it is predictive. It has some predictive value, less or more. That was the hypothesis test you were seeing when you ran linear regression. But there are many kinds of hypothesis tests. Here you are measuring a hypothesis test of difference in means of two different groups of, of drug-taking patients, right? So, so based on these concepts, now you, you see whether you see uh, for chosen p-value whether your observed value is less or greater than that, so it falls here or not. And based on that, you take a decision of null or not. So if your p-value was, say, so let me give some more examples. So the same thing. It's a, it's a repetition. Everything that I said is put in the slide now for this test. You want to test if the diff no difference in means or if there's a difference, right, if one population is greater than the other. So you have the test statistic. Now you have, you know, the distribution of this test statistic. 
So that's normal zero one. You have an alpha that you chose based on that. You know the rejection region. You know what is the acceptance region. Now, what is the p value? P value is is your the probability in the rejection region. So basically, you reject H naught. Well, how do you take the conclusion now? Because your the computer is going to throw you all these numbers. Now you need to if you understood all these concepts, you'd be able to take your decision in a more uh, guided way. So the conclusion is you reject your null hypothesis if test statistic falls in the rejection region. That's why it's called the rejection region. Or equivalently, uh, if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha. So, so if you're alpha, you chose 95%, 1 minus alpha, your confidence was 95%. If 1 minus alpha was 95%, your alpha was 1 minus 0.95, which means 0.05. So basically, you chose an alpha of 0.05. And if you observe the p-value is less than 0.05, so if your p-value was 0.01, then you reject the null hypothesis. If it's greater than 0.05, then you accept the null hypothesis. That's how you use it. Um, so this is another, uh, some medical procedure, cervical dystonia, and there's some, uh, this is an, uh, some sort of a medical, uh, uh, you know, like a disease or like a state or a syndrome, and you're trying to see uh, for women if, if the individuals are suff suffering from it or not, and you have some response, and you're using... Uh, you know, uh, a, bot a specific Botox kind of a treatment to improve the, uh, the condition and you're applying it on two groups, group one and group two, one group receives Botox, one group receives placebo. Placebo is a very common English term. It means you're giving them something that they're believing that you're getting, you're getting the, the treatment, but in, in all honesty, that treatment is a useless treatment. It's like I give these guys some antibiotic and these guys, I give them something that looks like an antibiotic, but that's just a sugar pill, for example. Uh, it doesn't do anything. It's like an empty capsule. So uh, so you now you can measure whether the, the treatment you're giving is better or not with respect to that. This is another example of the same thing that we've done before. So you compute the values. This is your null and alternate. You compute the test statistic. You have a value. Now you know the prob uh, that this distribution is normal zero one. So with that normal zero one curve, you compare where this 2.82 falls. And then you know what the rejection region is, and you know what the p-value is. And since 0.0024 is less than 0.05, then what do you do? You reject it because it's too small uh, to accept it. Um, and then there is what is known as two-sided test, uh, which means your condition, what you're trying to test is uh, something like this. So. You're measuring null is equal to zero. If you have a not equal to condition on the alternate, then it's a two-sided test because it means mu1 could be greater than mu2 or mu1 could be less than mu2. Both things are possible. But if your alternate was specific, if you're saying I want to test mu1 is greater than mu2, it's known as a one-sided test. Um, in that case, you look at both sides of the curve, this side and this side. Um, okay, I don't want to get into the power of a test. This is something to do with the beta value because it's the other kind of an error. Um, I want what we've studied to kind of simmer in your minds for a while. Uh, go through these slides, search about it, read about it. There is many, many kinds of hypothesis tests. We just covered two kinds, but for all the hypothesis tests, the overall uh, procedure is still the same. You have a test statistic, you have rejection region, you have p-value, the same concepts. The methodology is the same, and that's the most important thing you first need to understand uh, before we move into uh, even more deeper areas uh, when you study other things in this area. Any other questions? Uh, Pramit, I have a question. I mean, I just want to make sure. So, hypothesis testing, is it something like a, a technique that we use or apply on a specific attribute to determine the response variable or is it like some, like any other model that if we, like, we learned in, a, in the previous classes about models and stuff like or any other stuff that we, we applied for all the attributes and generate a response variable. Uh, uh, yeah. Do you understand my question? Yeah, yeah, I do understand. So, hypothesis testing when applied to models is a very specific case. Um, we're talking about a much bigger picture here where you don't even have a model. I'm asking a generic question, right? If I go to a good statistician, like a good statistician, and say... I ask him a question, is this political party better or the other, which is, is Democratic Party in America going to get more votes next time or the Republican Party? One way you can answer this is fit models to data and all that, right? Another way is you take survey, you, you run experiments on groups of people, 
and then before the elections happen, this is known as an exit poll, right? You have two results from groups of people about both these parties. And then if I just give him these sheets of numbers uh, of my experimental survey, which is a very simple survey in some ways, to understand the numbers. But taking the decision is very hard, whether you go with Democrat or alternate. So, or the same thing with the drug design. Um, or uh, coming up with a question saying, are people in CBSC schools in India more intelligent or ICSC school or uh, SSC standard state school, right? Or are people in government schools more smarter or are, are students or the current students in private schools smarter? How do you answer these questions with concrete statistical evidence? So these kind of questions, there's nothing to do with models here, nothing to do with attributes or response variable. That is very specific to a regression problem or a classification problem. That terminology is used only in regression classification or clustering, right? Here it's not about that. It's, it's about looking at samples of data coming from one group or two different group of multiple groups. Sometimes you might have 10 groups of data, right? How do you take the decision? Uh, of the kind of generic real life questions I'm asking. So that is where the question I'm asking and the decision will decide what your null hypothesis definition is, what is your alpha hypothesis? Is this one better or the other one? And based on that, then you choose what test to run. So that is where hypothesis testing is relevant. It's much more broader than just the regression or classification models that you studied, like you said, in the previous courses. Previous, um, yeah. All right. So this is where hypothesis testing is used. How do you compare groups uh, of observations? Um, so let me show you one more thing, actually, um, in answer to this. Say we're talking about multiple groups. So this, this is an animal. I just want to show you an example. I don't want to talk about how you do it now. Okay. Okay, apparently there's a, a blender called ANOVA, but anyway. Okay, apparently this ended up in somewhere in IBM's website. But anyway, what is this showing? Let me zoom it. So this is another example, right? You're running this through SPSS or Cognos. Cognos is a business intelligence tool. Since you were talking about, you know, like your interest in BI and stuff. These things are usually available in all BI tools as well these days, apart from using R and Python for it. So say there was a question. The question I'm asking you is, I want to see across these one, two, three, four, five groups. What are my groups? Groups are based on education. Did not complete high school. People who did not complete high school, people who did just high school degree, people who also completed some college, some college degree, people who did PG, post-undergraduate, post which means post-graduate education. Across these five groups, now we're talk not talking about one or two groups, we're talking about five groups. The question is, is the average household income Okay, in, in thousands, right? So like 10K, 100K, I don't know, 2000K, whatever it is. Uh, is it significantly different across all these five groups or is it similar? If it is the same, it would mean maybe the level of education does not matter if everything else stayed the same. If it, or if you, are, if you want to concretely say, is postgraduate degree salary much better than uh, some college degree, undergrad degree? It may or may not be true. There are a lot of millionaires who have not done, who have even dropped out, right? Like Bill Gates has dropped out, right? So your data is very skewed. If you're collecting this from Seattle, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, if they're in your survey, you need to be very careful about how you're taking your decision. Uh, because these two people, uh, I don't know if Jeff Bezos did not drop out, but Bill Gates did drop out, right? So if you take his income, uh, he's one of the richest guys in the world. So if, you, if I put that in your Excel sheet, apart from other people in my survey, he would fall and did not complete. Uh, so he only did high school degree. He did, not come, he did not graduate ever. He dropped out of college. Um, um, and then would you say, take a decision and say, hey, based on this data set, high school degree is more than enough for you to earn as much household income or even more than more household income than other people. So these kind of questions that I'm asking and data can come in all kinds of forms. Bill Gates may or may not be in a data set, but you can have all kinds of data sets. Uh, but if you ask a statistician, what is the right way to do these things? Uh, that's when you run a hypothesis test. And the, like I said, there are many kinds of hypothesis tests. This kind of a test is known as an ANOVA, uh, ANOVA or analysis of variance. Uh, 
So that's one example. So there's nothing to do with regression or attributes or variables. I only give you numbers from different groups. And I want to say which group is better or the same than the other group. So this is ANOVA, for example. Anyway, yeah. So this is an example. Does it make it clear or? Yes, Pranit. Yeah, OK, cool. Uh, Pranit, uh, can I safely assume that uh, these models are used uh, uh, to know the distribution of the data or just to prepare the data for analysis? These hypothesis testing is a technique that is only to take a decision when you're comparing groups of data. It, uh, it does have assumptions on what distribution your data is having. Okay. It is not measuring the distribution. It's not coming up and telling you what distribution it will have, but it is assuming. Okay. So there are some tests that do not assume distribution of data. These are known as non-parametric tests. Um, so uh, the test that I showed you in the slide where you're doing mu1 minus mu2 bar by standard deviation, right. that is a parametric test, uh, which means it is assuming that your data is normally distributed or right. it is distributed as a T distribution. In reality, not everything is normally distributed. If you plot it, everything will not look like a bell curve, right? Every right. phenomenon will not always be a bell curve. In that case, where you can still run a hypothesis test, but you cannot run that test. You need to run some other hypothesis test. There is something called a Wilcoxon rank sum test. Um, so you can run, um, not the sign rank. Yeah, the Wilcoxon rank sum test. This one you can run, for example, there you don't have to assume any distribution of the data. So you don't have to worry about any distribution. This is a test that will come up with a p-value and you can take a decision of H0 or H1 uh, in comparing two different groups. Okay. Um, then similarly, the ANOVA assumes some dis has some distribution assumptions. Um, but then there is a non-parametric version of ANOVA. Where ANOVA is nothing but running a test not across two groups or one group, but across multiple groups. You can have five, 10, 100 groups. So there, there is a, a non-parametric version where there is nothing to do with distribution null assumption. It's known as the Mann-Whitney test. So that's the Mann-Whitney test. It's a non-parametric test, okay? Uh, so it is, it is measuring what ANOVA is doing. So SPSS is a popular IBM tool that has Mann-Whitney test, for example. So all these tests, there's lots of tests available in a lot of BI tools and obviously in coding languages like R and Python as well. Um, so yeah, so I hope you got the big picture of what the methodology is uh, and the fact that there are many kinds of tests. Some tests have distribution assumptions, some do not. And another practical big picture about the fact that these tests are available in all BI tools, all packages, all languages these days. Um, and you would have these real-life questions coming up. So how would you take a decision by looking at data sets from multiple groups? That's where you would use this. And you don't have to compute everything by hand since the computer is doing it. But still, just looking at the output of it, if you do not understand how hypothesis testing needs to be used, you won't be able to use it properly. That's the reason you need to understand the process so that you can interpret your results properly. Uh, and then once you're used to it, once you do it many times, it's as simple as looking at an x-ray and saying, hey, you broke your leg or not. It's as simple as that because all these packages throw out a very similar format of output. You know how to interpret it. Uh, you know the overall situation. Um, obviously, there are some special cases which you would learn better by experience, but at least for the most part, you would be okay. Um, cool. Anything else? No, problem. Sure, go ahead. I think I'm done.